Today we're going to be making some aluminum isopropoxide, which is a useful reagent in organic chemistry. It's mainly used to oxidize secondary alcohols to ketones, or to do the opposite, which is to reduce ketones or aldehydes to alcohols. Depending on the direction of the reaction, it has different names. If we're reducing a ketone to an alcohol, it's called a mirvine pondorf verley reduction, or MPV reduction for short. If we, however, decide we want to oxidize an alcohol, it's called an open hour oxidation. The direction of the reaction really just depends on what our starting material is. I plan to use it in an MPV reduction to make 1 octen 3 all, which is supposed to be a chemical attractant for biting insects. I've shown here the overall pathway that I'm taking to get to the 1 octen 3 all, and I've highlighted in red where the aluminum isopropoxide comes into play. To prepare the aluminum isopropoxide, we needed isopropyl alcohol, mercuric chloride, iodine, and aluminum foil. In total, I used about 300 milliliters of isopropanol, 0.2 grams of iodine, 27 grams of the aluminum foil, and 1.65 grams of the mercuric chloride. The isopropyl alcohol that I used was 99%, and then I went ahead and dried it more over molecular sieves to try to get it as close to 100 as possible. This preparation is water sensitive, so any water that's present will negatively impact the yield. The iodine that was used here was purchased online, but it can also be produced from iodine tincture. I have a previous video where I show this preparation, and I also made the mercuric chloride in a previous video, and I'll provide links to both of these in the description. To show you guys the entire apparatus, I unfortunately had to shoot a little bit of vertical video. It might look a little bit complicated here, but as we progress through the reaction, you'll see exactly why each piece was needed. The only really important thing to point out here is the drying tube that I've connected using some red electrical tape. As I said before, this reaction is water sensitive, so I connect the drying tube that's filled with calcium chloride, so it's still open to air, but no water can get into the apparatus. The funnel on the right is only used to add the aluminum foil to the flask, so that will be replaced with a stopper before the reaction starts. 27 grams of aluminum foil was weighed out, and then using a pair of scissors, I chopped it up into smaller pieces. The aluminum foil was then added to the reaction flask with great annoyance. I could have cut the pieces up a little bit more, but I was kind of lazy, and I paid for it later because the pieces got stuck when I tried to add them. I ended up just adding small amounts at a time, and then jamming it through using a pair of scissors. I purposely didn't cut the pieces up too much in the beginning, because the smaller the pieces are, the faster the reaction will be. By chopping the pieces up, we increase the surface area, and in general this increases the reaction rate. By keeping the pieces larger, it reduces the reaction rate, and it gives us a little bit more control. After all the aluminum foil had been added, I went ahead and dumped in about 0.2 grams of iodine. Then, on top of everything, I added about 260 milliliters of dry isopropyl alcohol. As the isopropyl alcohol is added, it takes on a slight yellow color as it dissolves some of the iodine. At this point, we don't need the funnel anymore, so I take it away and I replace it with a stopper. So while the other things are hanging out in the reaction flask, I start to prepare the mercuric chloride solution. To do this, I added 1.65 grams of mercuric chloride to an addition funnel. I then poured in about 40 milliliters of dry isopropyl alcohol. As I added it, I moved it around the funnel to try to wash down any mercuric chloride that might have been left behind. After the isopropyl alcohol was added, the funnel was removed and I replaced it with a stopper. When we take a closer look at the addition funnel, we can see that a lot of the mercuric chloride still hasn't dissolved. It's not super soluble in isopropyl alcohol, and to get it to dissolve, we're going to have to heat things up. The proper way to heat things up is to use a heat gun, which is effectively just an industrial grade hair dryer. It took quite a long time to dissolve everything, and the basic procedure was to just heat it up using the heat gun, and then shake the addition funnel around to mix things up. It really did feel like it was taking forever and it wouldn't all dissolve, but eventually it did. Now we're left with a nice hot solution of mercuric chloride and isopropyl alcohol, and we're ready to get the reaction started. 
The mercuric chloride solution was added all at once by turning the addition funnel to full blast. A little bit of isopropyl alcohol was used to wash the addition funnel and this was also added to the flask. After everything's been added, I try to turn the stirring on, but there's so much aluminum that it really doesn't work very well. Because the mercuric chloride wasn't added dropwise, we in theory don't actually need to use an addition funnel at all. The main purpose of the addition funnel here was to keep things contained when we prepared the mercuric chloride solution. By preparing it in the addition funnel, we don't have a risk of splashing, and we don't have a risk of spilling things when we try to add it to the reaction flask. After everything's been added, things do start to react, but it's extremely slow. To get the reaction going at a decent rate, we're going to have to heat it up and get it to a reflux. The reaction that we're carrying out here is between the aluminum and the isopropyl alcohol to produce aluminum isopropoxide. The reaction is catalyzed by both the mercuric chloride as well as the iodine, and I'll quickly explain how this works. When fresh aluminum metal is exposed to air, it very quickly reacts to form an oxide layer on the surface. This oxide layer acts as a physical barrier, and it prevents the metal from undergoing further oxidation. With this oxide layer, our aluminum is pretty inert, and if we want things to react, we're going to have to get through this protective barrier. So to get through it, we use a combination of mercuric chloride and iodine, and I'll start by explaining how the mercuric chloride works. Mercuric chloride is a salt of mercury, and when it comes into contact with aluminum, it forms something called an amalgam. The formation of the amalgam disrupts the oxide layer, and it leads to the exposure of fresh reactive aluminum metal. Without the oxide layer to block things, the aluminum can react with the isopropyl alcohol and form our aluminum isopropoxide. The iodine is a little bit different because not only does it disrupt the oxide layer, but it also reacts with the aluminum itself. When it reacts with the aluminum, it forms aluminum triiodide, which then reacts with isopropanol to produce aluminum isopropoxide and hydriodic acid. The hydriodic acid then reacts with aluminum to produce more aluminum triiodide, and the cycle continues. As things heat up and start to boil, we'll develop a white mist in the reaction flask. The mist develops because we're boiling off a little bit of aluminum isopropoxide, and this reacts with moisture in the air. The product of this reaction is an extremely fine aluminum hydroxide dust, and it gives it this misty look. This should only really happen though at the beginning of the reaction, and as things progress, it should clear up. For this reaction, it's very important to control the heat, and to have an efficient condenser. The condenser that I'm using here is pretty efficient, but I found it was still very easy to overwhelm it. The solution turned black as the reaction progressed, and the aluminum foil slowly disintegrated. Right now, there's still way too much aluminum for the stir bar to work properly, but eventually we will get things stirring. Our endpoint of this reaction is when we can't visually see any aluminum left. At this point, it doesn't look like there's much aluminum left, but time-wise, we're only around the 50% mark. The second half of this reaction was really tedious because I didn't really feel like I saw much happening. Eventually though, we did reach completion when it looked like there was little or no aluminum left. At this point, it was pretty late at night, so I took the reaction off heat, and I continued the preparation the next day. When I came back the next day, I was left with a solid chunk in the reaction flask. This is actually a pretty good sign, because aluminum isopropoxide is a solid at room temperature. The next thing that we need to do is remove any excess isopropyl alcohol, and the easiest way to do this is by simple distillation. Due to the presence of crystallized aluminum isopropoxide, the contents of the flask will look quite goopy and solid. As things heat up and we progress with the distillation, the aluminum isopropoxide will slowly melt and liquefy. Our goal here is to remove any excess isopropanol, so we collect everything that comes over below around 80 C. When the rate of distillation slows and the temperature starts to dip, we know that there's very little isopropyl alcohol left, and we stop the distillation. The next thing that we need to do is vacuum distill the aluminum isopropoxide. Before we do this, every joint has to be greased, and we can't use a condenser because the aluminum isopropoxide would freeze in it. 
When everything looks good, we can start the distillation, so I turn on the vacuum and I start heating things. The reaction mixture is still hot from before, so it's very important that the vacuum is turned on slowly. What initially comes over is leftover isopropanol, and this can be discarded. The receiving flask was changed out for a new one, and now with all the isopropyl alcohol gone, we can start to collect our aluminum isopropoxide. To keep the apparatus hot and to help things come over, I insulated it with a little bit of aluminum foil. Before long, we start to collect some of our viscous aluminum isopropoxide. As it comes into contact with our colder receiving flask, it starts to crystallize and become a little bit opaque. The rate that it was coming over was actually pretty fast, and it didn't take long before we were done the distillation. In the distillation flask, we're left with a lot of black residue and a little bit of aluminum isopropoxide. Immediately after the distillation, things are a little bit too hot to handle. As I let things cool down, it will slowly become more and more opaque as the aluminum isopropoxide solidifies. Once things were only warm or slightly hot to the touch, I decided that I would transfer it to a storage bottle. I transferred it to the bottle while it was still warm because I really didn't want to have the possibility of it freezing in the flask. If it freezes in the flask, you'll be left with a solid chunk and it will be a pretty big pain to get it all out. Something that's interesting is that if you look at the bottom of our storage container, you can actually see there's a little bit of mercury there. This means that during the distillation, some of the mercuric chloride broke down back into metallic mercury and was distilled over into our receiving flask. When mercury is used as a catalyst in this preparation, this is a pretty common occurrence. If I wanted to, I could have removed the mercury using something like a pipette, but it's not really a problem here, so I opted to just leave it. Aluminum isopropoxide has a pretty big tendency to supercool. So even though it's cooled down to room temperature now, which is below its freezing point, we still have a liquid instead of a solid. When I dip a stir rod into the liquid and pull it out, the aluminum isopropoxide immediately starts to solidify. It still has a little bit of trouble so it doesn't become completely solid, but instead it becomes more of a gel. The final yield was about 189 grams, which corresponds to a percent yield of 93%. As I said before, this aluminum isopropoxide is going to be used to make one octen 3 all. Other than that though, I don't really have any plans for it, so if you guys have any good suggestions, please leave them in the comments. Just as a quick side note, it took a few days or something like a week, but the isopropoxide did eventually solidify. Anyway, that's all I have to say for now, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Anyway, as usual, I'd like to extend a big thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon, and especially those who donate $5 or more. Anyone who donates and supports me on Patreon gets to see my videos 24 hours before I release it to YouTube, and if you donate $5 or more, you get your name at the end of the video like you see here. In the next few months though, I want to work on my Patreon page a lot, and I want to get more rewards going, and maybe even get some higher tier ones, and I want to also offer some Patreon exclusive content. Also, as usual, here's the videos that I've currently filmed, and the ones I plan to work on. If you have any suggestions or ideas, please feel free to leave them in the comments.